also have this essay, The Liberal Imagination, on the, the sort of emotional um, or psychological simplicity of liberalism. Right. We tried to reduce everything to managerial technique. Right. And Trilling wanted to talk about imagination and deeper things, which we'll get to. The, the second figure, who I think he writes in one of the essays in this book, wrote an essay which hit him, I forgot the exact phrase, but with the force of a thunderclap, was Leo Strauss, right. who has since become more famous. Uh, <laughs> Notorious. <and, laughs> so uh, what was Strauss and what does Strauss mean to him? Uh, Strauss lived actually about the same time as Trilling. I guess they must have died within a couple of years of each other. I know Strauss died in 73. Uh, emigre from uh, German, Germany, a German Jew, or a Jew who grew up in Germany, as he once called himself, um, who ended up teaching at the New School in New York and then at, more famously at the University of Chicago, a great, great student of political philosophy and of the great texts. Uh, my father wrote a review. Strauss was quite obscure. He's now somewhat famous, but he was quite obscure when he published a, a difficult book called Persecution in the Art of Writing. I think in 19, I think my father's review is 52, so the book might have come out a year before that. Um, with essays on medieval thinkers, including Maimonides. Um, and Strauss really showed that to understand these thinkers, you have to read them much more carefully than people had been doing in the past, that these thinkers had thought through a lot of these questions that people sort of assumed, well, they're confused, or well, they hadn't really considered the tension between certain things they had said in the books. And uh, my father did write a, a really an interesting review. I, I ended up studying with Harvey Mansfield, who himself was a student of Strauss, so I got very interested in all of this later. And I went back and read my father's review which I didn't really know about, I don't think, until I mean, it was in grad school or after, of persecution in the art of writing. Um, uh, it's really impressive that he saw uh, the depth of Strauss's achievement or, and the depth of his challenge to conventional ways of reading these authors and how it, it really reopened the, the past. It reopened the question of the, you know, reading the Greeks and the ancients, the classics seriously, taking seriously thinkers like Maimonides, uh, thinking about Machiavelli, whom my father has an essay about in this book. Um, so, and he said later on uh, that he was most influenced, he thought, by, by Trilling and Strauss. Uh, less, I think, because of any particular teaching of either one of them, and neither, neither of them really had simple teachings, either, but because they really, I think, uh, they were both critics of a simple-minded liberal progressivism, which I think we, one forgets how dominant that was, in a way, at the right. time. Mm -hmm. And nor were they, on the other hand, romantic reactionaries who loved, you know, mm, 14th century Britain, they weren't so, you know, so Walter Scott's Britain or, you know, or, or the monarchy or the church. They were very, you know, clear-eyed about the limitations of, of, of these uh, different uh, regimes of the past. So they were friends of liberalism who were critics of modern liberalism, right. uh, who read texts that maybe were deeper than some of the current liberal texts. And I do think they had a big influence on my father. Right. And so when he, he then went off to encounter, I guess, in London, for Encounter Magazine. Right. At the very beginning, I think, of 1953, <coughs> I spent, I was born in December 52 and spent most of 53 to, I don't know, 1959 when I was still six years old uh, in London. He co-edited Encounter Magazine with the well-known poet Stephen Spender. And I think he really enjoyed that. He, I think, uh, getting to know the British intellectual and political class at that time, was very interesting for him. I mean, it's an impressive group, and, and why wouldn't it be interesting? Auden, I mean, he certainly had a lot of friendships and experiences with people who were, uh, who are now become, you know, yeah. who at the time were quite famous and have become, I suppose, more famous and more interesting. He uh, mentions in one of the essays in this book, and we'll talk about later, the, that he was ed editing Encounter when one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, Michael Oakeshott, <laughs> submits an essay which he thought was a fascinating and a brilliant essay, which is in collected in Oakeshott's book on rationalism but he rejected it because he didn't like it, or he didn't agree with it. I don't know if that was a right editorial decision. Yeah, I know. I was, I was struck by the way in which he says in the, in the other biographical, because he maybe he's being a little playful there. He yeah. said, I didn't agree with it, so I rejected it. And it's like, gee, I accept some things that the Weekly Standard I don't fully agree with. Um, but I, I think he, he uses that to illustrate, uh, and I think this is interesting, that, that he went to London, as many Americans have in the 20th century, gone to Europe, uh, and he very much liked living there. My mother was a British historian, so it made a certain amount of sense to even be there. He, I don't think he ever really thought, and my parents ever thought of settling there or staying there. And, I, and he even describes in one of his little, one of the memoirs near the end, uh, that he really wanted to come back to America because he thought America was this, I mean, he was American, of course, that's the main reason, but also because he thought America was the center of the, not just political action, but really the intellectual struggles of our time. And if, if there was going to be a kind of, thinking through of liberal, liberalism and constitutionalism and uh, beyond that of the sort of uh, relation of uh, well, all the issues he later ended up discussing. I think he had the sense, even back in 1959-60, 
that that was less likely to happen in Europe. I mean, Europe, he had the sense, was kind of on the way down, uh, though a wonderful place to he live. He would have been early to think that, because yes. in those days, Europe was the center of an elect and all that. And, right. Uh, but I think in retrospect, he was right, that the yeah. high point, high watermark of Europe was probably Camus and Sartre and even Aron, you know, these interesting thinkers who really peaked in the 40s and 50s and maybe into the 60s. And for all the hoopla about, you know, right. later on, you don't, you don't look back and think, gee, we've learned so much yeah. from that many Europeans, I don't think, for the last 20, 30 years. And he thought America was where the... Uh, debates would be had and where he wanted to participate right. in them and so they came back to New York in I think 59. Right and he spent 40 years famously uh, founding and then editing the public interest and a uh, believer in small magazines. Right. Yours is probably a little too big for his taste. Well he said that to me. You <laughs> know, <did>. and, yeah <laughs> when we started off and we had about 60, 70,000 subscribers we now have 100,000. Uh, he was kind of well what do you want that many subscribers for really? You know the public interest <laughs> had 10,000 at the most usually about five or six thousand and it had a huge influence so you know. Yeah. <laughs> and the, I, to me the quick trajectory of the public interest is started out as a technocratic uh, overseer of the, of the great society who would write essays using social science data down to see what the great society was doing right and wrong and then gradually evolved in a more I don't know if ideological is the word but a philosophical and more overtly neoconservative or conservative direction. Yeah, we started in 65. I would say it was always skeptical about the grand claims of the great right. society and about worried about the unintended consequences of social policy right. and a little dubious about the sort of great confidence which again we underestimate today in the early 60s of sort of technocratic social engineering, though maybe you could argue you see a little bit of it again today, perhaps with some of President Obama's people, you, you know, city, you can move all the levers just so and get all the outcomes coming out just right. And so a lot of the earlier work, but really throughout, of course, the 40 years, a lot of social science studies simply saying, well, here's what this program was supposed to do and here's, here are the effects it actually had. But I agree, especially after the late 60s and after the kind of the crisis in the 60s, um, my father got personally more interested and I think many other contributors got more interested and they, they, they published more on the moral and social side, you might say, of the, of the problems with modern liberalism and not just the kind of critique of this housing policy or this urban policy. Right. And at the public interest, you had some of the City College people, Daniel Bell and Glazer, but you also had Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Uh, I don't know if he was a co-founder there at the beginning, James Q. Wilson. I think they were people. all in the first or second issue, J Jim Wilson. Uh, wrote for, for its entire 40 years. My, my father has a couple of nice uh, memoirs in the, in the book. I mean, the, the essay he wrote for the last issue of the Public Interest in 2005, and then a little uh, uh, talk he wrote that he didn't deliver, actually, but at a little conference about the Public Interest. I think maybe you were there at yeah. Princeton. And, it was in, and that's in the book, too. In 2006, yeah. and that's in the book. Um, and no, it, there's really, it's all uh, incidentally available free uh, mm -hmm. online at the, at the website of National Affairs, which is a magazine, as you know, that uh, uh, edited by Yuval Levin, which was started in 2009 as a kind of successor to the public interest. My father closed up the public interest in 2005. He thought they'd kind of done their job and um, there's some time for, to let others to take over. And, and um, Adam Wilson, who's done a fantastic job editing it the last uh, eight or ten years with my father, um, got a job elsewhere and he just decided, you know, we had a good run and uh, always leave them, what's the expression? Wanting oh, more. Always more. leave them wanting more, you know, so why not in the case of magazines, right. just like in the case of uh, rock stars or something. But actually, I think its absence was missed maybe a little more yeah, than he expected and uh, various people got together to uh, Mike Grieby from the Bradley Foundation, Robbie George from Princeton, Eva Levin, I was involved a little, uh, to say, well, maybe there should be a successor started. We thought of actually bringing the public interest back to life, but I thought that's you know, too much of a burden to put on a new magazine to live up to that. It always be, uh, though the new magazine has been terrific. Um, and actually, one of my father got the first issue of National Affairs. It was Labor Day of, of uh, 2009, so it was two weeks before he died. And, and he was still in good shape. I mean, physically failing some, obviously, but, but mentally in good shape. And he was uh, very touched by the little tribute to Yuval wrote in the preface to the first issue of National Affairs that this was a successor to the public interest, but you know, the public interest is the most influential, you've, uh, you've all said, the most influential public policy journal in American history, and it couldn't aspire to that highest standard, but it still hoped it would carry on the tradition. It was very nicely done, and my father was touched by that, and I think uh, wrote Yuval a note, and uh, it was a very nice sort of note to go out on, and yeah. National Affairs is going strong, and the sixth issue just came out. You yeah. cited it several times in, the, in your columns. Yeah. Isn't it good? It's I mean, it's really yeah. high quality, and very much yeah. like the public interest in being, yeah. most of the articles are pretty hard-headed. Right. Here's how you could solve the deal, not solve the deal with the budget crisis. Here's a sensible way to think about state pension reform, but with also some articles 
by people like Leon Cass and Diana Schaub and Ralph Lerner on sort of broader, more philosophical topics. Right. And I think it has all the public interest back issues online. Yeah, so I'm sorry, that's how it so all the public interest issues are online, the back issues at, at, uh, at National Affairs, uh, at the website of National Affairs, which is nice. And a lot of it is, stands up awfully well, yeah. I've got to and say. I have the uh, 25th anniversary issue, which had a great essay by Jim Wilson, by Moynihan, by various people. Recommend people on that, uh, but let's get to uh, the the title of the book. Uh, these days, to have the word neoconservative on the cover of a book is almost an act of provocation. The word in the last uh, four or five years has become twisted and changed. Uh, but public interest became a, a neoconservative journal. Your father was maybe the one and only person on earth who embraced that. Right. That was invented by critics. Uh, so, what is it really? Yeah, the term was invented, I think, by Michael Harrington, the democratic socialist, as a kind of criticism of these liberals who claim to still be trying to defend liberalism in 1970, 71, 72. And Michael Harrington said, well, they're just conservatives, or maybe they're neoconservatives, new conservatives. And of course, at that time, in, in intellectual circles, or even media circles, I would say, in New York and elsewhere, just saying the word conservative, or any variant of it, even neoconservative, was just, you know, you're out, you're expelled from, from serious uh, intellectual or political life. This is, of course, a few years after Goldwater on the political side, and on the intellectual side, uh, there's only National Review, and that was underrated at the time, to say the least. So um, my, my father, after a couple of years of, I think, a lot of people saying, well, no, we're still kind of liberals, and we still hope for a kind of hard-headed, centrist, yeah. uh, Cold War, anti-communist liberalism, my father, I think, was the first, maybe, of that group to sort of just say, you know what, fine, if you want to call me a neoconservative, right. you can do so. And there's some very, uh, he's got an essay in the book, I think from 1976, on neoconservatism, right. and then the autobiographical essay and a couple of the other essays that kind of go into how he, um, in fact, had already kind of concluded privately that he wasn't yeah. really a liberal anymore. Though, of course, a lot of what neoconservatives do is defend liberalism in the broadest sense, liberal yeah. constitutional democracy, limited government and the like. But that liberalism had gone so off the rails, my father thought by the early 70s, that uh, uh, um, one might as well forget about the term. And I think to be, uh, and he says this, he, he became more and more conservative, really. I mean, in the sense he just thought the conservative truths were perhaps more important than, he had always been open to them, more open to them than 95%, I would guess, of New York intellectual types. But I think he became more convinced of the importance of certain conservative truths, even if maybe a neoconservative version of conservative truth, uh, in, uh, in the 70s and then afterwards in the 80s and, and 90s. And I think a lot of the most interesting, th interesting things in the book for people would be the kind of reflections on American conservatism and the relation of neoconservatism to a, a more a pure conservatism, which my father thought wasn't either very practical or in some cases desirable uh, for a modern right. big <coughs> country, a great power This like may America. be an oversimplification, but some people say you can define a conserv different kinds of conservatism by what year you want to go back to. <laughs> and so some people want to go back pre-New Deal. But my impression, your, your father was fine with the New Deal, but probably pre-Great Society. The distinction being, and I, he has a very provocative essay in the book about two different sorts of welfare states. Uh, one, a state which I think he calls an opportunity state, which gives you the tools to move up, and one which is an environment state, which tries to create an environment based on compassion. And so one was in tune with the sorts of virtues he admired, and one was not. I yeah, I think that's right. I think he also thought A, the New Deal did for a number of good things, and B, I mean, he would acknowledge also made some mistakes, but, but that you can hope to go back to that era if one wants to. A, one should acknowledge, which a lot of conservatives don't, the ills of that era. I mean, we also talk about going back to pre-civil rights movement and pre-all kinds of other things, you know. Right. And secondly, um, isolationism and the like. And, and secondly, I, I think he also, um, so he thought it wouldn't be desirable. And in any case, it's utterly impossible. Um, I do think that, I think you're right, it's a shorthand, obviously, to say that you know, it's sort of when do you want to go back to. Um, my father, this famous quip that a neoconservative is a liberal who's mugged by reality, right. and also has the impression that the reality was sort of what reared up in the late 60s, and it turned right. out it wasn't as easy to have a war on poverty that succeeded right. as Lyndon Johnson thought, and it wasn't as easy to do social engineering right. experiments as other people thought. Um, though I think if you read the essays, what's striking to me is right away my father, and, and this is true of other neoconservatives too, got beyond the kind of simple critique of the programs and saw 
as he says in one of the essays about the welfare state, there's a financial crisis of the welfare state that we're seeing now in right. spades in Europe and in California and New York and, and in the U.S. government. And he discusses that quite uh, appreciably, I would say. He wrote an essay in 96.